did anyone besides me look around at the beginning of Joy to the World and see how many people were smiling? When I got here, the Dodsons had already, had already looked at the program for the evening and they said, don't get too excited, but we're singing Christmas songs tonight. I may have a surprise for you about that. When Isaac Watts was going through the Psalms and writing a paraphrase of the Psalms, he was looking at the Psalms through New Testament eyes. And in 1719, he wrote the Psalms of David imitating the style of the New Testament. Psalm 98 was his basis for joy to the world. He never intended it to be a Christmas song. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. That hasn't, the earth hasn't accepted him yet. Joy to the earth, the savior reigns. Not yet. No more let sins and sorrows grow. They still are. He rules the world with truth and grace. Not yet. Psalm 98 is a messianic psalm, but it's about the second coming, not the first. It was never meant to be a Christmas song, but we can sing it celebrating the joy of the first coming and our anticipation of the second. That's free. Now we'll get into the devotional. So we're going to have a, a Christmas in July devotional. We will start with a few verses that influenced the life of Nicholas of Myra, who in turn inspired Santa Claus. And we will conclude with Santa's testimony. Nicholas was born long ago, far away, but his faithful giving still inspires today. It's a story with chapters, both old and new. Please listen as I recite just a few. His wealthy merchant parents died in his youth, but not before teaching the gospel truth. Tis more blessed to give than receive a lesson young Nicholas did surely believe. His parents died in a plague when he was young. He went to a local monastery to live with his uncle, Nicholas. Yes, same name. And eventually each of them in, in, their, tar, in their turn became Bishop of Myra. Few teens have the wisdom and self-control to manage great wealth. Nicholas, chose to give his away. Direct your children to the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. It is from a New Living Translation. My favorite story about Nicholas giving away his wealth is also the most likely to be true. Here's a story that remains well known, showing his wealth was God's, not his own. He gave it to help so many in need, not wanting others to know the deed. A once wealthy man sank into debt. It seemed his three daughters' fate had been set. If he did not pay, the girls would be slaves, working to satisfy the most naughty of knaves. Nicholas of Myra came up with a plan to secretly help the girls and the man. At night in the darkness, he went to the house when not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The girls' stockings were hung by the fire with care in order to dry them in the well-heated air. A bag of gold coins through the window he threw and into a stocking, the money it flew. One girl's dowry now was made sure 
she would marry to live a life that was pure. Twice more he went, a dowry to give, a bright, happy life each daughter would live. That third night, awake, the father did wait to catch the giver and curiosity to sate. In thanking Nicholas, he fell to his knees, but Nicholas begged, tell no one, please. In Matthew's gospel, the sixth chapter, is recorded instructions from our Lord when he tells us, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Early biographies of saints tended to include embellished stories that kept being repeated saint after saint. This story appears to be unique among the saints, which suggests that it is more likely to be true than most of the stories that keep being repeated. While it's unique among the saints, there is something of a connection to Philostratus's life of Apollonius. Apollonius was a Roman myth whose life story included many of the same miracles Jesus performed. Apparently, the Romans preferred having a Roman savior than a Jewish savior, and this was written to counteract the popular Christian stories. The life of Apollonius also included a story of him giving money to a destitute man to keep him from being embarrassed. No mention is made of what happened to his children. In the Roman world, a woman's virtue was, was of little concern compared to a man's reputation. Some have suggested that the Nicholas story was borrowed from Apollonius and given a Christian twist. I look at it a bit differently. Both stories were written centuries after they were supposed to have happened. For Apollonius to give money to help a man not be embarrassed seems to be against the Roman emphasis on strength. The New Testament and the early church had an unprecedented, unparalleled concern for women. For Nicholas to give money to help three girls escape slavery, be being sold as slaves, is consistent with the New Testament and the early church. Apollonius giving money to help a broke man, not consistent with Roman emphasis on strength, Nicholas giving money to save three girls from being sold into slavery, consistent with the New Testament and the early church. May I be so bold as to disagree with the scholarly critics and say that since both stories were written centuries after they were supposed to have happened, it seems, it seems reasonable that Nicholas was the original and the Apollonia story absorbed Nicholas and gave it a Roman twist. Well, I, I, I will agree though that the, uh, the gold coins landing in the girl's stocking was, strikes me as, as possibly a, a, a later embellishment. That, that, that does make sense to me. Most men who become saints do not live long they were killed by men determined to do wrong. An evil Roman emperor placed Nicholas in prison. He outlived that emperor. God had his reason. Matthew 5, 11 says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. There are accounts that he was thrown into prison by Emperor Diocletian during the Great Persecution, the last and worst persecution of Christians. None of the surviving records confirm this, but it is plausible. Nicholas outlived Diocletian 
and was freed by Constantine. The documentation that he was at the Council of Nicaea is inconsistent. There are no notes of his participating, but he does appear on three lists of attendees, including the list by Theodore the Lector, which is generally regarded as the most accurate list. Reports are that he slapped an Arian at the council meeting. That eventually grew into stories that he slapped Arius himself. Anybody know who Arius was? Oh, the philosopher and back. Who was Arius? Theologian that was deemed a heretic. Er early heretic, yes. Well, something that has been suggested is that the supporters of Nicholas did not want him remembered in a bad light, and they made sure that this incident and his removal from the council because of it were not included in the minutes. If that happened early in the council meeting, that would explain how he made it onto the lists of attendees, but not into the minutes. It's speculation, but again, it's reasonable. Nicholas died as all men do, but his way of life still inspires a few. His legendary life some did inspire of their faith and charity never to tire. As his life, after his life, the stories they grew, the title of saint some thought overdue. He became the saint of children, thieves and bakers, of butchers and sailors, and even pickle makers. Wait, the saint of thieves, you may ask, how could he help so wicked a task? He helped them to repent, not to steal, to honestly labor and earn their next meal. But we won't take the time to discuss how he got all those titles, but uh, it seems that he was proclaimed the saint of more cities and more professions than anyone else who was not a biblical character. Well, since I added a few words at the beginning, I'm going to, for, for those who are following the notes, I'm going to skip a page just for the sake of time, but I will mention that the relics from Nicholas were kept in only two places. An examination shows the relics are compatible with being from the same person, a person who had spent years in a, in a cold environment, like the dungeon of a Roman prison, and the uh, fractured nasal bones indicate a severely broken nose, which would be consistent with the, the beatings that Diocletian would have Christians given while in prison. But we'll not, we'll not spend more time on that. Let's, let's go directly to a, a Santa testimony. Some of the stories about Santa are pretty embellished, but this is a true story. About 50 years ago, some friends of mine, preacher and his wife, adopted a shy, quiet, five-year-old boy. As their first Christmas approached, they asked, do you know why we celebrate Christmas? Yes. Oh, why do we celebrate Christmas? It's Santa's birthday. No, no, no. Oh, it's the day we have chosen to celebrate the birth of Jesus, the Redeemer. Too often when we think of the miraculous birth, we limit it to the virgin birth. But there may be a greater miracle in that birth. What happened when Jesus came to earth? First, he left the splendor of heaven to be born in a stable 
wrapped in rags and laid in a feed trough. A manger is a feed trough. And if you've never cleaned one out, they can get messy. He left the banquet tables of heaven to suffer hunger in the wilderness for 40 days. He left the adoration of angels to be disdained by men. The real miracle may not be the virgin birth. The real miracle may be that God loved us even though we did not deserve it. Jesus loved us so much it hurt. He left the splendor of heaven to be born in a stable, wrapped in rags, and laid in a feed trough. He left the adoration of angels for the disdain of men. He left heaven's banquet table to suffer 40 days in the wilderness. He did it because he loved us. God's redeeming love is at the heart of Christmas. If you recognize this song, please join me.